All right, you guys asked for it and I like to give the people what they want. So this is going to be a two part series about my server and how I access all of my files, my videos, anything from anywhere in the world. In this video, we're gonna talk about kind of the rationale behind why I do what I do with my server, the hardware and the software that's involved. In part two, we'll actually set up a complete service for you to use and you should be able to go Watch this video, watch the next video, and you should be able to have exactly the same setup that I currently have. I always like to talk about purpose before getting into anything. So why would I wanna do something like this? I know some of you are saying, Josh, I could just pay Google or Dropbox or somebody like that to host my files and I'll pay them, you know, 10 bucks a month. I'll be laughing, I don't have to worry about anything. There's a couple reasons that I kind of go the opposite direction. I'm a, I'm a bit of a contrarian in my everyday life and this is another way that I am. But I personally like having the full control and responsibility over my files and I wanna be able to know what's going on with them. I wanna make sure that I'm the only person that can see them. I just don't like the potential for we'll call it abuse of uh, having your files on, on a cloud service. So what we are effectively doing is setting up a cloud service, but you own it. And that's the big difference. And that's something that I personally really, really love. Before I get into a little bit more of this, let's just talk about what I currently have. I have a home server that works as a file network attached storage or NAS. And that allows me to access my files on any of my devices on the network. That means my desktop behind me, that means my laptops, and that pretty much makes it so I don't have physical storage on my computers. So what I have done is I have built in another fail safe were my computer to get stolen, for example, Laptops do get stolen. I know that somebody's probably not going to steal my 10 year old ThinkPad, but who knows? Somebody else may be a meme lord too. But in working with Linux, you understand that you may, uh, you may break things. And the frustration of getting your files back if they are on a computer that you've black screened is not an enjoyable experience. It can be done, but I would just rather not deal with it. So in my 15th time that I bricked my Arch Linux installation, I decided to put my files not on the computer that I'm going to eventually brick. I know it sounds silly, but frankly, it has created a ease of synchronization across all of my devices. So I don't have to worry about, hey, my laptop has this file. Hey, my desktop has this file and they are at different positions and I don't have to worry about doing something with Git or whatever. For me, it's a really good solution and it allows me to access all of my stuff anywhere. Device number two that I have is actually, is actually one of these little guys, just a little Raspberry Pi. And what that does is allows me to set up a VPN and I get into my network via the VPN and if you know anything about networking, that means that you are inside your network. You can do anything you really want. You can access the devices that are active on the network. And that allows me to hit my NAS and deal with those files from anywhere in the world. I know that has a little bit less weight to it today uh, due to circumstances. <laughs> we'll say, say it that way, but it is really nice to be able to pick up where you left off at home and go down to the coffee shop pull up where you were and just keep going. I love that. Inevitably, what's gonna get asked too is why don't I use an off the shelf solution like a QNAP or Synology? Uh, I don't have a great experience with QNAP. I had a client that lost a bunch of files um, because there's proprietary uh, hardware raid on those devices and if they go, they go. Um, and they generally do fail before the hard drives on them. That's not to say that they don't work, but when they don't work, they really don't work. Synology I've heard better things about, but I really don't have experience with it, so I won't comment. I wanted a open source solution. I wanted to be able to pick and choose my hardware, upgrade it if need be, 
and that will provide me a solution that will work for years and years to come as opposed to something that's irrelevant in three years. I already touched on the second point of why I do this and that's because I don't have any local drives on any of my computers. That allows me to pick the lowest storage configuration of a laptop and be done with it. This is really important for devices like laptops that do have the potential for theft. I mean, desktops do too, but I think your laptop's gonna get stolen 10 times before your desktop ever does. Those files are more important than the laptop itself for most people. So having the files not accessible on the laptop, unless you actually VPN into your own network, you kind of alleviate that issue. So somebody can come and steal my 10 year old laptop, but they're not gonna have the things that I've worked on for the past 10 years. And that to me kind of provides a sense of security. Let's talk about redundancy too for a second, because if I'm overseas, for example, and I have my laptop with me and it gets stolen, I'm pretty much screwed. But if I have my server running at home and then I don't have files on that laptop while I'm overseas, I could literally pick up a new laptop and pick up where I left off in my file system and I'd be laughing. I'd probably be crying because I got a laptop stolen from me, but you see where I'm going with this. That also leads me to the fact that it's more cost-effective storage. So <laughs> go put a configuration for a laptop that you want to buy on any site. It doesn't matter what it is. You're going to get absolutely gouged on the storage. Reason being is companies know they can do this because it's generally soldered onto the device now. You can't really upgrade it in most laptops. So you're stuck with the 128 or 256 or whatever configuration that you decided on. And you have to use that for the rest of the laptop's life. I can go buy a four terabyte hard drive for, I don't know, 120, $150. And that's much more cost effective storage in a centralized server. It's slower storage, but I could also grab SSDs or whatever. All of my computers effectively just have their configuration files that gets the desktop up and running, and then the files are all served by my, my NAS. If I really, really need additional storage, I can just take an external SSD or something with me with the files on it. And generally that's what I do just for redundancy's sake because who knows? Maybe my server gets turned off at home while I'm abroad and I'm screwed. That's why I take something with additional backup to it. I have a 256 gig micro SSD and a cheap tablet that has movies and stuff on it too. So it's not like I can't access this stuff if I'm in the air flying somewhere because generally there's not great Wi-Fi or any Wi-Fi on planes still. Get with it, airline companies. I think that the biggest point that most people really wanted to know about is that how do I access my stuff from anywhere? And my solution didn't really start out as a cloud solution, we'll put it that way. It was just so that I could have a easy synchronization across all of my devices and that was good enough for me. But then I realized, throw a VPN on this thing and you can access this solution from anywhere in the world. To me, it's a killer feature now. I built my own cloud and so can you. And this brings me to my final point of data ownership and responsibility. I don't really trust other people. I'm a tinfoil hatter, I don't have it on right now, but regardless, I don't really trust other people with my data. If I'm able to manage that myself, all the better for me. I know that some of you are exactly like me and this will be the perfect solution for you. And I know that some people will be like, I can't be bothered, I'll just pay my $10 a month to whichever uh, cloud provider and I'll go on my way. And that's totally fair, but for me, this was a additional step that I really wanted to take. On top of that too, I have multiple companies that have important data that shouldn't be on cloud services. We'll put it that way because I don't want people's data being accessed when I'm the one that should be responsible for it. That's why this is also a great solution for a small business owner or somebody like that who deals with important information that shouldn't be getting out to the general public. This also makes you less of a target too, because these cloud providers are massive, massive targets. 
if you hack somebody like Dropbox, you have so much information that it's probably worth tens of billions of dollars at this point. I'm a much smaller target. I have a little less than $500 server. People aren't probably gonna be looking for that. And to me, that's a benefit as well. Finally, this also allows you expandability. So I can run this CPU till it dies, get a new one in there. And this solution may work a decade down the road or even longer. Generally, I assume hardware solutions for storage are going to be coming down in price too. So what I paid for four terabytes today is probably gonna be eight terabytes in two or three years. It's just how technology works specifically in the storage space, not so much in the silicon space nowadays. Let's talk about hardware here for a second. So the first device that I mentioned that you could run something like this on is this Raspberry Pi. And I won't talk about running TrueNAS on Raspberry Pi. I don't think it's possible. I don't think that they support ARM architecture, but something like Open Media Vault, I have heard works well on Raspberry Pis and you could have this solution up and running for less than a hundred bucks. How I use the Raspberry Pi is as a dedicated VPN and ad blocking machine. And this allows me to get into my network. It allows me to not have ads actually anywhere in the world if I'm browsing on my network. And it's pretty damn cool for a hundred bucks. I highly recommend people get these, play around with them. Maybe you don't end up using it for this solution, but these things are so versatile that you could use them for dozens upon dozens of other applications. The second thing that I'll mention is a dedicated server box. And that could be for a lot of people, probably an old computer that you just repurpose. That's an always on computer. That's what a server is. You don't have to go out and build something like I did. I just didn't have a desktop that was lying around from a couple years ago. And on top of that, the hardware doesn't have to be expensive. I run a Athlon 3000 G or something like that. It's like a $70 CPU that keeps this thing running. No problems whatsoever. It doesn't even hit 25% capacity. Most of the time it has 16 gigs of Ram. Same thing. I think it runs 13% capacity on 16 gigs of Ram. So it's not a very intensive hardware requirement, uh, use case. If I were to do it all over again, I wouldn't have built in an ITX case. I built in an ITX case thinking, oh, you know, like I'll only ever have a couple drives and whatever. It's becoming apparent to me that I'm probably going to need to upgrade the case in the future just because I can only fit about four hard drives in it. And that's not the best solution for a NAS. I know that multi-bay NASs have, you know, four, six, eight, sometimes 12 or 20, whatever. Get a bigger case and that will help you out in the future. If you have a old desktop, I would hazard to guess it's a larger case anyway. As you probably see from the B-roll, there's additional hardware that I have on my network, but that's not necessary at this point. We'll get into other stuff that you can do with a home server in the future, because I, I think it's just really awesome to be able to host like a chat server or an email server, or to be able to access all of your media via like a, your own Netflix type thing with Plex or Jellyfin or something like that. So we'll touch on that stuff in the future. I haven't delved too much into it, but these videos will actually help me selfishly in the future to have documentation as to if I break something, how do I fix it? Uh, in addition to these two devices, you need a router that allows port forwarding. I think most modern routers that any ISP gives you is gonna come with this functionality. But if you're on a home IP address network, that IP address is not generally going to be static. It's going to be continually changing and you'll need something called a dynamic DNS server to point to that continually changing IP. I don't know how often it changes. It probably differs across ISPs, but for me, it's like once a month, I have to change the uh, home network IP address. My dynamic DNS takes care of all of that. I don't have to worry about it. A keyboard, mouse, and external monitor is also gonna be helpful because you can plug in your TrueNAS installation into a monitor, you can see what's going on, and then you can take it off and operate it completely headless after you're, you've done that. It's nice to have a extra monitor lying around because sometimes things go awry, you plug it into the HDMI port and you're, you're good to go. The final thing I'll touch on in this video is the software that I use to create the solution. I kind of mentioned TrueNAS, and that is a enterprise grade NAS solution that you can implement on pretty much any hardware. 
The reason that I went with TrueNAS over something like Open Media Vault is I actually don't know how popular Open Media Vault was when I did this. I had created this solution right after FreeNAS became TrueNAS. So I don't know if that means anything or not. And then the second piece of software that we use is a WireGuard VPN. And with something like PyVPN, which is a script that installs the VPN direct to a Raspberry Pi or a virtual machine or anything like that, you can have this running in five minutes. It's amazing. So we'll go through all of that setup in the next video. Make sure that you guys are subscribed so that when the next video comes out about how I create this server solution, you're the first to know and you can do it too. Thank you so much for watching. And I hope that this has kind of piqued your interest into the home server, home lab space. And in the next video, I'm gonna show you how to set it all up.